I welcome you back to our continuing study of the Gospel of Matthew. We find ourselves here going to be looking at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 11, reading from the New Testament in modern speech by R.F. Waymon. Chapter 26 and verse 11. I've referred to this verse in the last reading. The poor you always have with you, but you will not always. But me, you have not always. Now, there are two extremes here that obviously when you go through this study, you'll find that I've gone to one extreme. The two extremes in the church is we can ignore the larger political events we are in, or we can immerse ourselves completely in political events. Now, what I want to say is, I think the idea that we immerse ourselves completely in political events is wrong, and to ignore completely political events, and when I mean political, social, cultural, economic events, is wrong. My opinion is that if we are true to our message of faith and of the gospel, that our work of the church will impact the social, the cultural, the economic. In that sense, a church that completely ignores these is not being true to the gospel. At the same time, when a church gets totally involved in the political, it's going to come at the expense of the faith. And so I take what I believe is a mineral approach, be true to the faith, and you impact the world socially, culturally, and economically. Now, that, that I want to use as the way to set the stage for what I'm talking about. We... The, this is one of the most powerful statements of Jesus here. And I think it's important for us to really grasp the implications for it. Now, when that is said and done, let me understand, let me throw out where I am coming from in terms of my ministerial training. I was trained as a minister within the broader Methodist heritage. John Wesley lived from 1703 to 1791. And when I went through my ministerial training, at first, I kind of got that ministerial training without the historical background. If you were to understand John Wesley, and his work in particular in England. Now, obviously, the Methodist movement had tremendous impact in the fledgling American Republic. That's a different story. But focus here on England. The Methodist movement in England is birthed as there is wider social, cultural, economic happenings. And simple speak, the Industrial Revolution had taken hold in England. And the Industrial Revolution led to massive social change. The Methodist movement's ministry and their zeal to be true to the gospel of Jesus Christ led them to impact the society going through disruptive changes. Now, basically, a hundred years later, you have the emergence of William and Catherine Booth. William Booth's dates are 1829 to 1912. Catherine Booth's dates are 1820 to 1890. The Salvation Army begins its work in the last quarter of the 19th century in London. And again, they are, in a sense, following the steps of John Wesley. They are dealing with a society that is still impacted by the ongoing uh, convulsions of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, what we're saying is it wasn't that they decided to get politically and economically and socially involved. What we're saying is that their desire to be true to the gospel and bring the gospel to bear on people's lives led them to be politically, socially, and economically involved in their world. Now, let me in a paragraph step in very controversial waters. If you study the labor movement in the United States and Canada, and I'll focus just here, a key moment is the formation of the United Auto Workers. And I understand this is a very simplified account of labor history, of the history of the labor movement. So you have the UAW, United Auto Workers, formed in 1935. Now, the issue is not whether you like labor unions or not. That's not the point. It's not the issue of whether you think they're good or bad. What we are saying is 
the reality is that this one union set a standard that would impact a lot of other industries. The Industrial Revolution brought great wealth to the owners, who often did not share it with their workers. This meant in the 18th and 19th centuries that factory workers did not often make living wages. It meant that children were often working in factories. It meant extremely long work weeks. What we're saying is that the union movements provided a balance in the labor-owner relationship. And I would say that for the owners, the unions were not in some ways all bad. It protected them from some of their own excesses. The purpose and direction of the Methodist movement cannot be separated from the larger forces that were at work in society. The Methodists were not the first to reach out to the poor. Don't get me wrong on that. They were not. What we are saying is that a style of ministry was born in that era out of the necessities of the world that they lived in. And some of those excesses were corrected by the labor movement of the 20th, 20th century. What we're saying is that it was not a decision to be politically, socially, and economically involved in their culture. What we're saying is that their desire to be true and authentic to the gospel drove them out into the wider world where these problems were. So when Jesus says that the poor will be with you always, what I am trying to get at is understand that there is a side of poverty that is always in a state of flux. The poverty of the 18th and 19th century was born out of the Industrial Revolution and certain changes economically, socially, culturally, politically. Poverty is an issue in every age, but in different ways because what poverty means is different in different ages. So what we have tried to labor to say is that poverty is a complex thing, and to dismiss Jesus' statement out of hand shows one ignorance about the forces behind poverty. And I think it's what we're trying to get at on the one hand is to say that Jesus is neither for the poor nor for the rich. Jesus is for the kingdom of God and the need for us to be made right so that we can be in the kingdom of God. When I look at this passage, what Jesus is pointing us to is that the church, in the midst of all of what is going on in the world, must be a community of faith that realizes the centrality of worship. It is as we worship Jesus and understand who Jesus is that we can be effective in reaching out into our world. In fact, if we truly worship and magnify Jesus, we find ourselves going out into the world and taking his message and truth and applying it where it needs to be. And if it is in the throes of the Industrial Revolution of the 18th or 19th century, it will shape and define our ministry in certain ways. The issue is not social, economic, and political issues in and of themselves. No, what we do in terms of ministry must always be born out of the fact that we as a church are a community that seeks to worship Jesus above all else. It is Jesus and his worship that defines who we are, and it is our worship of Jesus that we carry out into the world to share with the world that we are in.